Hello and welcome back to Powerhouse San Pedro, where there is not a lot of religious fluff, but more of a straightforward talk based on the truth of God's word. Today, we will be doing that very thing. Today we will be, will be, today will be a straight talk to the point, no fluff, straight to the point. Do not pass go. Do not collect two. Well, well, we can collect two hundred dollars. But anyway, so are you ready? Are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay, you ready to handle some straight talk? Yes. Okay, no walking out. Uh, so fasten your seatbelts. Uh, please stay tuned for the whole broadcast because you're gonna want to hear the conclusion. I guarantee it. It will be worth the wait. So let's get. Right into it. Powerhouse is not a gathering for worship as much as it is a gathering place for training and discipleship. Whether we are in person or online, some ministries tend to focus more on the actual worship service, whereas other ministries focus more on outside of the service. So here at Powerhouse, our focus is to develop an individual relationship with Christ the living out of their relationship with Christ every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. A, a powerhouse worship is something that is learned, practiced, and experienced, and not just something we do every week because you're supposed to do it at church. Last week, following the broadcast with our studio audience, we experimented a little bit by worshiping God with the sound of praise rather than a typical song we, that we would normally sing. Um, you know, there is a worship song that the lyrics say this, I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you, Jesus. One of the fears of our local government leaders is that churches, when they gather, will sing and spray droplets <laughs> as if we sing into the faces of people. <laughs> but that's neither here or there, and I'm not going to get into that issue. But I want you to think with me. I want you to think with me. The heart of worship is not singing. The heart of worship is Jesus. Now, I understand they don't understand that, but do we? They may try to muzzle our singing, but what they don't know is that worship is not about singing. It's about Jesus. And if we can worship with no sound, we can worship anywhere. While being discipled, we want to learn how to develop things to be used outside of the four walls rather than inside of the four walls. How do we do that? That's what we want to continue to figure out. And so that's what we're doing now. As a training center, we are mindful that even prayer is not just something we automatically do at church, or it shouldn't be. If we're not thinking, prayer can easily morph into just a normal thing we do as Christians or something that we use in a service to segue into another part of the service or as an intro or an outro of a gathering. Did you know that worship is prayer? I want to ask you to practice something this week and for one minute a day 
Sing your worship to God without sound. Just without sound. If you have a designated time alone with God, then practice doing this during that time. You just have to do one minute. Don't get carried away and do an hour and then you're all burnt out and you can't do it the rest of the week. Just do a minute. Do a minute and sing your heart out with whatever song or any melody that you want, but without a sound. Without a sound. See what happens. See what happens. And But if you do it during your quiet time with God, then I'm going to ask you to even do another twist. Don't do it in the beginning or the end of your time. Do it somewhere in the middle, somewhere where you have to stop and do it and then continue back. So that's a challenge, and I want you to do it, but let me know. And if you don't let me know, let someone know. What happens? What is, what, what is God doing when you experiment and you practice uh, different things? It's interesting because many people in many ministries think that we are these restrictions from our government, our local government, are, are causing us not to be able to do things. Are you kidding? They're just pointing us in another direction that we haven't pointed before, and we will, able, we will be able to bring beauty from what we think is ashes and God that's his MO so I don't freak out about any restrictions that are given I just kind of think wow Lord so what are you going to do now which way are we maneuvering see because you can't take worship away from somebody they can't take it out of my heart they can't take joy from me they can restrict me they can keep me from doing any other thing that I would want to do but they no one can take the joy from the Lord from you. So um, today, people in our studio audience are praying for you. While they're listening to this message, right now. So that whomever and whenever you watch this broadcast, there will be a wave of the Holy Spirit present right where you're at. And when the Lord is present, be mindful of what happens. These teachings from Powerhouse are also designed to free people from religious emptiness. Religious emptiness may sound good at the moment, but it doesn't last. It doesn't last past the parking lot. It doesn't last past the first 30 minutes after the broadcast or 30 seconds. Since religious emptiness only feels good for the moment and doesn't last, you need to fill up often because it doesn't stick. It's like when you're dehydrated and you drink a glass of water. It doesn't seem to refresh you. It's like you're, you're, you're drinking, but it's not quenching your thirst. So may these words that you hear today quench the thirst in your heart and in your soul. That's our prayer. So do you mind if, I, if I'm frank with you? Because I am. That's my middle name. So but I'm going to be frank with you. Speaking of dehydration now. Ooh, that was refreshing. <laughs> anyway. This year, and especially these last four months, have been a year of growth in the Lord. I mean big time growth. I'm talking like life changing walk with God kind of growth. I, I know that many of you here, even in our studio audience, and those of you that are listening to us have, have been experiencing greater trust this year, greater faith this year, greater hope than ever before. And I know I am along with you. The bottom line is this. If you don't want to grow in the Lord, you won't. I guarantee that you won't. But if you really do want to grow in the Lord, you will. Because if you want to grow, you will go out of your way to change your life. Growth is not automatic. You won't grow 
by just wanting to. You won't grow by praying. You won't grow by going to church or listening to church, watching church. You won't grow by saying that you've grown. You won't grow by reading the Bible. Anybody can read the Bible. But not everyone does what the Bible says. For example, like trusting God rather than having fear. Fear and worry does not come from God. Just want you, I want you to just get that. Fear and worry does not come from God. Fear and, wor wor fear and worry comes from the devil. That's one of his things that he uses. All fear comes from the devil. All fear. All fear comes from the devil, period. Now, some of you might be thinking, doesn't the Bible say that we're supposed to fear the Lord? No. Not the kind of fear that we tend to think of. It's talking about a different kind of fear. The fear in the Bible is a deep respect. It's not an afraid fear. Well, how do you tell the difference? Here's how. You cannot fear and trust God at the same time. You can't. It's impossible. You cannot fear or worry and trust God at the same time. You have to choose one or the other. When you are experiencing an afraid kind of fear, you're not trusting God. When you are experiencing a respect fear, you can easily trust God. That's how you know. You see, bad fear eliminates God from the equation. Good fear leads you to only trust God. For example, good fear is like, God is so powerful that I, I want to put all my trust in him because because putting my trust in anything else is futile. Bad fear is like, I don't know. I don't know if this is going to get better or not. Bad fear is based on hopelessness. You cannot fear, worry, or fret, or stress out, and trust God at the same time. Just tuck that one away. You have to choose one or the other. And when you choose to trust, you grow. You grow. You grow when you use and apply and utilize things like trust. That's how growth happens when we do the word of God. Not just here, but we do it. Trust. Trust is like stepping out of the boat with your faith in God and using hope in any situation. Growth doesn't happen all by itself. You have to go out of your way to utilize the tools God has given you. And that's what I mean by going out of your way. You have to actually move from the path that you are normally on. So if you really want to grow, then you're going to step out of that path. But if you just want to think it and stay in that, growth won't happen. We've all been around people that say they know the Lord. And I don't know if they do or not. But when the pressure comes, you see them worry, panic, fear, and they get all serious. You see, when you trust God, you, you can't wait to see what God is going to do in that situation. It's like, what are you going to do? Oh my goodness, Lord, this is so huge. What are you going to do? That's the difference between trust and worry. The prince of this world is the author of that fear and worry. 
and he doesn't want anyone to trust God. And so you have to choose one or the other. You see, when you trust God, and then when God comes through, you actually see him come through. When you're not trusting him, it's really hard to see what God is doing. It really is. And when he does it. You okay? Yes. Got kind of quiet in here. <laughs> That's okay, because we'll just pause for a moment and, and, and let that sink in. I don't want to just run too far. In the psalmist, it's called, the pause moments is called a selah. Because sometimes you just need a selah. <laughs> yeah, you just need to stop and go, take it in. Okay, you want, want to keep going? Yeah. Good, because we're really early in the broadcast here. <laughs> the bottom line, the most powerful weapon of the devil is lies and deception. Started with Adam and Eve. He lied about God. The devil lied about God to them and manipulated them and tricked them into choosing to disobey God and ruining their lives and the whole human race. Thank you very much. The tricky part about deception is that when you're deceived, you don't know it's happening. As they say, the proof is in the pudding. And we're talking about a fruit-based pudding, the fruit of the Spirit. You see, when you don't know if you're being manipulated or tricked, you look at the results. You look at the fruit that's coming out of you. Because you can't, deception, you, you, can't, you, you can't see the process. You don't know when you're being deceived. That's why it's called deceived. So you have to look at what it produces. Galatians 5.22 says that the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit within us is divine love and all its varied expressions, joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. The fruit produced by the prince of this world, the devil, is shame. Meaning, you're not good enough. You haven't done enough. You're not going to be able to be enough. That's shame. Guilt. His fruit is hopelessness, where you can't see anything getting better. You just see it getting worse. His fruit is stress and anxiety, impatience, discouragement, depression, fear, insecurity, and the feeling of failure. Have you seen any of those fruits? <laughs> the prince of this world has been leading people around by the nose away from trusting God forever it seems. How do we know? How do we know if we're being used by the devil? Now, I'm not talking about demon possession. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the kind like Peter was used. Do you remember when Peter was in the garden and, and Jesus said, Peter said, no, they're not going to take you. And Jesus goes up to Peter and says, not to Peter, but he says to the devil, he says, get behind me. Does that mean Peter was demon-possessed? No, I'm saying that Peter was tricked. He was manipulated. And if Peter can, then so can we. So how do we know? By the fruit. Remember that. How do we know? By the fruit. If through these multiple crises today happening, you develop an us and them mentality, you are being played. There's a Salem moment. If you are developing an us and them mentality, you're being played by the prince of this world. 
Because Ephesians 6 says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We're his creation. We're on this side. But if you find yourself with an us and them, you're being played. As a result of being played, too many live in fear of what will happen next. We're seeing it everywhere. We're watching it everywhere. Fear of bad and worse happening. That's called hopelessness. If this time on earth that we have, we choose, the time that we have here on earth, we choose where we will spend eternity. Some people, it's like, why are we here? This is your time to choose. A hundred years here on earth is nothing compared to eternity. While here on earth, we are given a free will to choose God or not. A free will. That means in order to give mankind a free will, God must let them do as they please without his hand in it. This is why we see consequences of mankind's choices being played out on the just and the unjust, on the good as well as the bad. This is why bad things happen to innocent good people. Giving mankind a free will means that very thing. Now listen to this. God does not protect everyone. But he does provide for everyone. He provides restoration. He provides healing. He provides provision. He provides comfort. He provides reconciliation. He provides forgiveness. He provides power. He provides authority. He provides new life. He can't protect us in everything because we would, it wouldn't be a free will then. But because he has given us a free will, he cannot protect us all the time. So instead he provides and he restores And he will bring back things that we think, wow, I would never change that in the world. If you could think of, there's things that happened in my life, bad things that happened that hurt. That if it meant not me being where I'm at right now today, I'm going to tell you, I, I say, I'm glad that happened. I wouldn't change a thing. Why? Because that's the kind of restoration God does. So he doesn't protect everyone, but he provides for everyone. The Bible says that you are either for him or against him, and there's no other position. At the end of your life, your time to choose will be over. Those who did not give God all of themselves will not experience all of him. Actually, you will not experience any of him. Someone once asked Jesus in the Gospels, how do you follow? How do we follow you, Lord? And this is how he he responded in Luke 9, 23. Jesus said to his followers, if you truly desire to be my disciple, you must disown your life completely. Embrace my cross as your own and surrender to my ways. (laughs) This is why going to church, reading the Bible, praying, being good, listening to teachings, and even calling yourself a Christian doesn't mean that you are following Christ. Surrendering and disowning your life and your way of doing life completely is the only way to be a follower of Jesus Christ, period. That's not my opinion. You just heard. That's Jesus. And if anybody's told you anything different, they're wrong because the word is right. And if you want to call that a Jesus freak kind of thing, then go ahead. My dad once told me that back in his day, they, they, people were calling them hallelujahs. Those hallelujahs. Well, call me a hallelujah. 
Jesus, uh, John 14, 6 says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Either you are totally sold out to God, or he's not in you at all. If you don't know where you stand, check the fruit. Check the fruit. Just because good happens to you doesn't mean that God is in you. It just means that God is good. And his goodness and glory is everywhere and so strong in this world, the world that he created, that we can't help but run into his goodness around almost every corner, it seems. And the fact that he loves his creation so much, he, he loves even those who don't follow him. He wants good to happen to those that don't follow him. He loves his creation. And the fact that we have his presence and his glory on earth is so many of us experience that goodness. But don't mistake that for him living in you. We also run into the blessings that surround his followers. If you don't follow God and yet you know someone who does, stick around them. Because you're going to start experiencing blessings that surround his people. People around those who follow Christ will often experience the blessings overflowing from his followers. See, because God doesn't just do enough. He likes to overflow. But there will come a day when time will be no more. That will be a day of final judgment. And the Bible talks about that day in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. It says this, Then I saw a great dazzling white throne and the one who sits on it. Heaven and earth fled from his presence, and they were no more. I saw the dead, the lowly, and the famous alike standing before the throne. Books were open, and then another book was open, the book of life. The dead were judged by what they had done as recorded in the books, and the sea gave up the dead souls that were in it. Then death and the underworld gave up their dead and all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and the realm of the dead were cast into the lake of fire. For the lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not recorded in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I'm reminded of eternity without God, what it would be like. Each time I don't drink enough water and in the middle of the night I get a leg cramp. Now I don't know what kind of leg cramps do you, but whoa, they are severe. And it always centers around if I don't drink enough water that day or I forgot to drink water. Now that happens, that's weird. And I like drinking water. But sometimes those leg cramps hit and they're so severe that in those times of pain, it seems they're so intense. It seems like it'll never cease. It just seems like it's getting worse and getting worse. And I have to convince myself in my mind that it will cease. And that hope alone calms me down until it subsides. But in those times of pain, I'm reminded of what endless pain would be like and every time I get a cramp I surrender everything to God oh God I give you everything I can't I can't imagine living eternity with pain never ceasing I don't know what's worse if I don't drink water and have cramps or I drink water and don't have cramps because every time I do boy I push the reset button for my whole life. Whew. And after it subsides, I'm like, it's like a sigh of relief. And I just say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. There will come a time for those 
who did not choose to give everything in their lives to God, where pain and torment will not cease. Can't imagine that. The reason is, is because mercy will not be there. Rest will not be there. Peace will not be there. It'll just be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth from the pain. Sounds horrible. Now I know why out of the 31 times in the Gospels that, that hell is, is mentioned, that it falls from the lips of Jesus 21 of those 31 times of how much he wants us not to go there. There will come a time when Satan will deceive himself into thinking that he can, he can get revenge on God by tormenting God's creation. Because every time that Satan looks at a human being, he sees God. Because we are created in the image of God. And although we may not know what exactly that means, when the devil looks at us, he sees the image of God. Genesis, it talks about us being in his image. And for all eternity, Satan will find pleasure in tormenting all those that did not choose to be with God for eternity. They will forever be his. I say that the devil will be deceived because he will think that God will be looking, but he won't. For the very first time in all of life, God will turn his back on his creation, never again to see them ever again for all eternity. The only thing worse than being tortured is the knowing that God cannot hear you ever again. So choose wisely. While you have breath here, because this is your only time to choose. I mean, we look at this life and it seems though it's going on forever. And we look at circumstances and we think they'll never stop and we don't know. But I want you, I want to try to give you a picture, the picture that I have. Someone once told me if I were to draw a line as far to the, the east or west, whichever direction you're pointing that you can and draw a line across the other way and go all the way around the earth with that line. And you have one line all the way around the earth. If you put a little scratch on that line, that little scratch will be like these years that we have here on earth. That's it. It's in that little scratch that we determine where we will be for all eternity. That's why 21 of the 31 times that hell was mentioned, it came from the lips of Jesus. Now, he didn't mention hell more than heaven. Jesus actually mentioned heaven three times more than that. But I want you to know that God doesn't send people to hell. Understand that. That's the reason why a lot of people, they say that they don't follow God. Because how can a loving God send people to hell? God doesn't send people to hell people send themselves if you choose with your free will to not follow or worship or surrender to god here on earth then for all eternity you will get the opportunity to do the same it's your choice you will be granted what you have already chosen eternity starts the day you decide for some of you, your eternity is starting today. For the ones who choose to totally surrender themselves to God, this time on earth will be the closest you will ever come to hell. If you give your life to God, I mean your whole life, then this time on earth, 
will be the worse that it gets. This is as bad as it gets. For the ones who do not choose to surrender their way in their life to God, this time on earth, this will be the closest that you will ever get to heaven. This is as good as it gets for you. So live it up. I totally get why people get angry when their world here is jeopardized, when their good times here on earth are disturbed. This is their heaven. Because this is the closest to heaven as they will ever get. This earth is not my home. And I want to help as many people as I can while I'm here within reason. Because when I leave this earth, as a wise man once told me, it just gets gooder and gooder. <laughs> Lousy grammar, but great theology. Choose this day whom you will follow. Why wait any longer? Is that risk really worth it? Today, eternity starts for many of you. And others of you, it's a time to check the fruit. I'm not saying that you could become possessed, oppressed, whatever you want to call it by the devil, but you can be tricked and you can be misled and used just as Peter was. And the only thing that brings is the devil's fruit. So if you find yourself in places of fear and discouragement and depression and that whole list of things and stressed out and anxiety and worry, that's not the fruit of the spirit. You're experiencing the fruit of the prince of this world. You may not be able to see how you're being deceived, but when you look at the fruit, you'll know which way to turn. And for many of you today, that way to turn is to God. I love how David said, Lord, search my heart. Search my heart, O oh God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. O oh God, search my heart. And if there's any trickery happening, if through this pandemic, this time period, I, there's not even one crisis that's going on. I think there's like two or three or four of them going on right now. But if it causes us to categorize in us and them, then we're being tricked right into it. Because the battle is not us and them. The battle is a spiritual battle. So I pray in Jesus' name that the power of your spirit, God, would be released over every home and every ear that hears right now. And I pray in Jesus' name that people are set free right now, right now, right now in Jesus' name, that these clouds of wolves that are up will be torn down. And Lord, that fruit will be identified and fruit will be discarded will be discarded. And we discard depression. We discard discouragement. We discard stress. We discard worry. We discard fear. We discard all these things. We discard hopelessness. When we look at this, this pandemic and we start to become hopeless, like this will never end, this is going to get worse, we better, th that's hopelessness. That's from the prince of this world, and we discard all of those things. We discard him in Jesus' name, and we release life, and we release hope, and we release faith, and we release trust like never before. God, show us our fruit that we can decide because our eternity starts now. It doesn't start when we can't breathe anymore. It starts right now. And we could know you and live in your presence right now, right here. There's so much to do here. There's so many people that I know today that are being set free. And I want you to tell somebody, tell somebody, because one of the MO of, uh, uh, of the prince of this world is secrecy is to keep quiet, is to doubt. 
So release that faith and tell, tell me, I would love to know and to hear what God is doing. You can, you can email me at church at powerhouse San Pedro.com. You could message here, um, you go on Facebook and you could message there, powerhouse San Pedro and anywhere you can, or tell somebody that's around what God is doing. And I pray because I know that in this time where the world is looking at hopelessness in this time, there's waves of beauty that are coming out that we've never seen before. There's freedom. While it seems as though our land is being locked down from freedom, you can't take freedom away from inside. So that means that in the darkest of times, the light will shine even brighter. And so there's victory happening every day. This is the greatest hour for the church. This is our greatest time. And so flourish in it and check your fruit. You can just check every day your fruit. And that's how you'll see. Because God wants you to walk in victory and with hope and with faith. So I pray that over you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a great week and a great life in him. Thank you.